Bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion, which is titled Rethinking the Pros and Cons of Randomized Trials and Observational Studies in the Era of Big Data and Advanced Methods. My name is Lise Gauvin. I'm a professor in the University of Montreal's School of Public Health and Associate Scientific Director here at the Centre de Recherche du CHUM, where I'm located right now. I would like to mention that the panel discussion that we will be uh, uh, sharing today is jointly organized by the Centre de Recherche of the University of Sherbrooke Hospital Centre, the Centre de Recherche du CHUM, which is the research centre of the University of Montreal Hospital Centre, and the Centre de Recherche sur le vieillissement. So uh, it's going to be my pleasure in the next few minutes to introduce you to a absolutely magnificent cadre of uh, researchers who will be uh, uh, providing lively debate in the context of this discussion. So first, let me introduce to you Dr. Nadia Surial. Nadia is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Management, Evaluation and Policy at the University of Montreal's School of Public Health, as well as the researcher here at the CRCHUM. Dr. Surya leads a CIHR funded program on the evaluation of primary care teams and their impact on health service utilization in older adults using causal inference methods. She has conducted a number of knowledge dissemination activities on the use of causal inference methods and is currently conducting a randomized trial on the effectiveness of telemedicine tools in older adults. Hello, Nadia. Uh, next, Dr. Alan Cohen. Uh, Alan is an associate professor in the Department of Family and Emergency Medicine at the University of Sherbrooke, as well as a researcher at the Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Sherbrooke, the Research Center, and uh, the Aging Research Center. Dr. Cohen is an epidemiologist and complex systems theorist with particular expertise in the aging process. He has training in ecology and evolution and has a long-standing interest in the philosophy of statistical inference. Alan, hello. Uh, next, Dr. Ellie Murray. Ellie is an assistant professor of epidemiology at Boston University School of Public Health and focuses on improving methods for evidence-based decision-making and human data interaction. Her work focuses on applications to public health and clinical epidemiology, Dr. Murray also conducts meta-research, evaluating bias in existing research. Her postdoctoral research fellowship in epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health focused on causal inference for comparative effectiveness and real-world evidence. Hello, Elena. Next, we have François Lamontagne. François is a full professor at the University of Sherbrooke as well as a critical care specialist and clinician scientist at the University of Sherbrooke Hospital Center, the research center. His research activities include clinical trials of resuscitation interventions and knowledge translation activities. He is co-scientific director of the CIHR funded Sepsis Canada Network and leads the Canadian Clinical Research Network, whose objective is to create high capacity, nationally coordinated infrastructure for clinical research addressing the health needs of Canadians and Canadian health care systems. Hello, bienvenue Francois. Uh, doctor, and last but certainly not least, Dr. Elena Lozina. She is a Robert Wood Lovett Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School. She is a Director of Policy Innovation Evaluations, V with a capital V, in Orthopedic Treatment Center and co-director of the Orthopedic and Arthritis Center for Outcomes Research at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Lozina leads an NIH-funded multi-site project to conduct health policy evaluations related to surgical and non-surgical management of knee osteoarthritis. She is recognized internationally for her expertise in melding rigorous clinical research methodologies across multiple discipline, clinical disciplines, from orthopedics to osteoarthritis to global health. Welcome, Elena. So um, we uh, have uh, identified a panel discussion, but to discuss the focus and setting up the discussion per se, I will turn things over to uh, Nadia and then come back with a couple of discussion, uh, a couple of points uh, operationally, because we would like this to be an interactive event.
Nadia, over to you. Thank you so much, Lise, and thank you to all the panelists for being here today, as well as all the participants who are listening in. Uh, we really hope that this webinar in the next hour and a half together will be interactive, so please do not hesitate to put your comments in the chat or questions in the Q&A. But what exactly do we hope to talk about together today? Well, we're in the world where um, any time that we want to ask questions like, was treatment A more effective than treatment B in reducing symptoms of a disease? Or did this program or policy improve care? Or does pollution increase the risk of mortality? Or even what is the impact of the pandemic on mental health? Anytime we ask these kinds of questions, we're really asking a causal question. Did A cause B? So in other words, can we attribute the effect that we observe to the intervention, or could it be due to external factors that we haven't accounted for? So in terms of answering these questions, randomized control trials, or as we call them RCTs, have been widely considered to be the, the gold standard in assessing cause and effect. But in the last two decades especially, there have been major advancements in research methods, data science, machine learning, causal inference methods, and this may change or shift how we view the quality of evidence from RCTs compared to observational studies. And observational studies, especially in the era and the advent now of big data coming from population-based data sources, we have social media, digital health tools. And so how can these new opportunities to use observational data uh, be used for clinical decision-making? So considering all of this, where do we stand in today's current landscape on where RCTs and observational studies fit in evaluating cause and effect? And part of the questions we also wanna ask ourselves and discuss with you today is how should we best guide clinicians and other researchers in choosing wisely between uh, different types of designs and having clear recommendations on how to choose and how to critically assess evidence to guide decision-making? So these are just some of the questions we hope to explore today. And so we really invite you to participate. And uh, as a follow up to this webinar, we also hope that the discussion we're gonna create today can also be uh, used to create useful infographics that we'll be able to share with you all and with the larger community, as well as a scientific summary of what are some of the points we need to consider and put forward as we continue in this new era of advanced methods and, and evaluation. So thank you once again, look forward to this discussion and I'll turn it back over now to Lise to lead us into the first question. Excellent, thank you very much for that mise en bouche, uh, uh, Nadia. Um, so the uh, team of panelists have identified two overarching questions which uh, they would like to be discussed to be discussed with the group here. I, if I look online, we have uh, just over 130 people who are online. And in order to make this uh, interactive, what would like you to, to encourage you to do is to write any questions that you might have in the section, which is on the bottom of the, your screen typically, which is the Q&A, the question and answer. And I will do my best to uh, address these questions and uh, comments to the uh, panelists. They will also be able to see um, the comments. Um, there's also the chat that you can use, but um, oftentimes there's a steady stream of information that comes through the chat. So um, I may not be able to uh, meld both of those things. So if you have a burning question that you'd like to bring to the attention of the panelists, please do put it in the uh, Q&A. So maybe um, then what we have decided for each of the overarching questions, we're going to give an opportunity to the panelists to uh, present a point of view and a few uh, critical ideas that they think should be part of a discussion around uh, the idea of pros and cons of randomized tri trials and observational studies. And so if they also have rejoinders, they will be raising their hands. So I will also be directing traffic in this regard. So um, the first question that, um, given the topic that we would like to address is basically what is in the title of uh, the panel discussion is, what are some of the pros and cons of RCTs and observational studies, and how does context matter? So in this sense, we're saying, where can observational studies go wrong? Where can RCTs go wrong? Where can they go right? 
We're also interested in what are the key questions to consider in terms of context, in terms of intervention, in terms of control groups, in terms of outcomes. So each one of the panelists will uh, be uh, providing a couple of uh, basic ideas. And again, let me encourage you to uh, use the Q&A and the chat to share some ideas because we really would like to make this um, interactive. So first off, I'm going to turn things over to Alan. So Alan, tell us what are some of the pros and cons of RCTs and observational studies and how does context matter in your view? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lise. Uh, thanks, Nadia, for an excellent setup. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so as Lise mentioned, my background is in ecology and evolution. And so when I first came up to my PhD to work in the biomedical world and biostatistics and epidemiology, I was kind of surprised to find the negative bias against observational studies, because where I come from, you, know, you don't go rerun evolutionary history a few times for a randomized controlled trial. You don't reorganize an ecosystem uh, usually to, to, to do a controlled experiment. And so you know, we're mostly based on observational studies for the whole field. And the same thing could be said of, you know, let's say, climate science and other fields. And so you know, I, I was thinking, well, if, if only controlled experiments are, are, are valid, does this mean we shouldn't believe in global warming? We shouldn't believe in a heliocentric solar system or evolution by natural selection? And you know, so I came in a little bit surprised by all of that. Since then, in the course of my career, I've put a lot of time thinking into to complex systems. And so you know, while I work in epidemiology, I also work uh, thinking about systems where there are feedback loops. And a lot of our statistical methods are not really designed to deal with that. So as Nadia mentioned, you know, causal inferences does A cause B. But what happens when B also causes A, or when that link between A and B and then B to A is dependent on C, something else that's happening in the system? And so, you know, our bodies, our societies, they're all complex systems. And, you know, to some extent, I'm coming at this with a view that a lot of our methods are really poorly adapted to these types of systems that we're trying to study. And, uh, you know, these complex systems will generate heterogeneity, they'll generate different effects at different time scales. And you know, so it's not easy to know what to do. And I've also come to understand why randomized controlled trials are so favored in the biomedical world. And I think there's a good reason for it, which is that they um, do a very good job of resolving confounding. So in case there's anyone here who doesn't know, confounding is the problem you get when it's a third variable that's causing the effect, not the main two you're looking at. So if I wanna look at, let's say, does alcohol consumption cause lung cancer? Well, people who drink more might also smoke more. So I have to worry that it's not really the alcohol consumption that I've measured that's related to the lung cancer, but some other measured or unmeasured factors such as uh, smoking. So, you know, confounding is a really big problem in biomedical research and randomized controlled trials in general do a, a quite good job of dealing with that problem. Um, we're also in, in, in a situation where we, you know, not we, not me, uh, but clinicians need to make discrete decisions. Do I prescribe or not this, this medication to a patient in what dose? And so it's not the same as a context where we're looking at global warming over 50 years, right? And we can come to some kind of consensus about what's happening. Uh, we need really discrete answers at, at a different time scale. Um, at the same time, like overall, what I've come to see in this is that the medical field has put all of the emphasis on avoiding problems with confounding. That's what randomized control trials are really good for. But if you want to look at other problems that you can have in research, such as heterogeneity of effects, external validity, um, compliance issues, their observational studies may actually be better for some of those things, right? Particularly if you want to get some real world context. So I feel like we've moved to towards a world where we have um, a very effective tool, this hammer that is randomized controlled trials that solve confounding very well. And now everything is starting to look like a nail and we're failing to look at all the other tools that are in our toolbox and to use them in, together in a concerted way to build a really stable house because a hammer's not enough to build a house. We need to put all this together. And so I think that's the perspective that I'm coming at this with today and I'll, um, and I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Alan, for kicking off the discussion and sharing some of those, so, those thoughts. Um, Ellie, why don't I turn it over to you? Your ideas? Thanks. So. Um... Thank you, Alan. I think uh, you brought up some really great points there. And I wanted to kind of actually sort of elaborate on um, some of those those points that you made and kind of maybe take them in a little bit of a different def direction, because I think, you know, it's definitely true that one of the big strengths of a randomized control trial is that it 
um, the process of randomization gets rid of confounding. Um, but we often think about that as this trial is confounding free when really it's getting rid of confounding at the time of randomization. Um, and the thing it's getting rid of confounding for is treatment assignment, um, which is not necessarily the thing that we're actually interested in. And so, you know, there are this benefit of the randomized trials that we have no baseline confounding for treatment assignment um, is a really useful one, but it's also in the kind of grand scheme of the things we need to think about of our studies, it's just one small piece. And so um, if we sort of put that, piece, that part aside and say, okay, this is a particular scenario with no confounding for assignment, almost everything else we might wanna do with that randomized controlled data is happening in the same way that it would happen in an observational setting um, of some kind that we don't have really control over basically any other part of the trial in quite the same way. I mean, you know, at least, you know, compared to like a prospective cohort study where we may be asking particular things and having people come in for particular visits that the participants are sort of going about their lives in the way that they would go about their lives anyways. And so I think, um, you know, I like, I like the analogy of, you know, if we have a hand, if we have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But um, I think, you know, the question is whether any of our other tools are really not hammers either. <laughs> and maybe it's just a difference between one type of hammer and another type of hammer. And this, this particular type has this nice property of no baseline confounding, but we've forgotten about all the other things that all of the problems with hammers <laughs> in general also apply here. And all the problems with observational studies can also apply to trials. Um, and I think that's something that um, you know, coming from the epidemiology perspective, we focus a lot on observational studies. And when I started to um, actually kind of get into working with trials, really realizing how many things can go wrong in a practical, actual real world trial setting um, was really eye opening because, you know, we're often taught that idea of, well, the trial is the gold standard and maybe an ideal trial in some hypothetical perfect world, but actual trials are, um, you know, often uh, maybe painted over with a, a gold paint and not actually a gold standard. Great, Th thanks Thanks for those uh, those thoughts, uh, uh, Ellie. Uh, why don't we go to Francois now, Francois? Hi, uh, and thanks for this, uh, this invitation and this interesting discussion. So, um, uh, I'm having to sort of reorganize what I was going to say, uh, uh, <laughs> um, having heard those great, uh, great comments. I have to say, as a disclosure, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of the clinician, right? So, uh, um, uh, and I probably don't have uh, the deep understanding of, you know, advanced statistics that the, my colleagues on the panel have, but I, but I am as a clinician in this situation described by Alan, where we sort of have to uh, you know, we, we probably share in the belief that the health decisions have to be founded in science. And then it's not that we lack scientific evidence, it's that there's an overabundance of, um, you know, scientific publications and there's an overabundance of, of uh, results to pick from. You can, you can pretty much find a study uh, for anything. And, um, and, and so I was, I've, I've got priors, I just to disclose, I, I was trained to believe in the primacy of, of trials for the specific reason mentioned by, by Alan. And, and you know, this, this issue of residual confounding is a big issue and, and it's a prior, uh, uh, you know, but it's, I've got to say there is some empirical evidence and from experience, there's certainly in the medicine, a very long list of examples where we held some things as a dogma. There were interventions that we administered for a very long time, uh, oftentimes based on observational evidence that were extremely convincing, only to refute them later on when we sort of um, imposed uh, upon ourselves this the necessity of running the experiment, right? Precisely for the issue of the, the confounding and and. Um, so, and it feels like it's not to say that trials don't also get it wrong. There's certainly a, another long list of trials that have gotten it wrong, but it seems like it's shorter. And I guess my, my the, the perspective here is that um, it seems like, I think we probably need to distinguish the uh, uh, critique or criticism of the methods from criticism of the individual projects. And they end up being sort of mixed together sometimes. It, it seems like applying the, the, the 
clinical trial, the, the RCT methodology, like there is such a thing as the optimal trial, perhaps, which does things very well. And I, the point is, and I don't want to be too controversial here, but per, I, I don't know that the optimal observational study can give you the same confidence in the effect of a treatment. We're talking about therapeutics here uh, and as quickly, right? I mean, uh, Alan's point to the evidence for the harm associated with tobacco or global warming, it just takes longer, right? And it, it's, it takes a very long time and people still aren't that convinced about global warming. And so, so the whole point is, I think continence is, is stronger for the reasons you, you raised and it, it, it's more efficient. And, and that's not to say that there are huge flaws, which as someone who likes or, or conducts cl clinical trials, I'm you know, the, probably the harshest critique. And the biggest problem is that you end up enrolling a subset of individuals in a specific context and the effects are like their findings are probably time limited. But, but there are ways to fix this. And I, I guess that's the sum of, of, of the point, right? That I probably, we might end up discussing in terms of innovations and ways to improve. And then the last point is, it's not because in general, I think RCTs are superior to assess effects of interventions, that there aren't situations where they're not needed or, or impractical or infeasible. It's just that those situations are somewhat rare. You know, the, the parachute uh, paradigm does exist in medicine and it has to do with signal to noise ratio, but there aren't that many situations where you absolutely don't need a clinical trial. And yeah, maybe more to come later on that. Thanks for those, uh, those comments and bringing uh, additional issues uh, into perspective. So maybe I can turn things over now to uh, Elena. Elena, some of your thoughts on this issue about what are some of the pros and cons of RCTs and observational studies and how do we address context? Elena. Thank you. I think, you know, we also, as always, as useful, need to go back to in history and kind of think of the evolution or development of methods or the capabilities of computers and analytic methods, because I think in some ways it helps to follow the history of evolution of methods in clinical sciences. And I think randomized trials, not in medicine, but in ag agriculture and psychology had been used in uh, as, as far as in 18th century. And I think that's where the, the question about not just uh, blinding and randomized assignment came into the mind. And I think if we think about the notion of causal inference, I think you know, we probably need to go to the very end of the 20th or 21st centuries primarily. And I think as we think about the history and evolution, it's really important to, to understand that not every question that we have is a ripe for randomized trial and not every question probably can be answered by observational studies. I think we probably, the, the, the most um, interesting example, if we can think about nutritional epidemiology, where the mainstream media can pick up every potential um, conclusions that you know high fat diets are bad for you or Mediterranean diets are good for you. And then a few years later, there is another observational study that totally reverses the conclusion. And it's later, I think, you know, the most of the nutritional uh, studies, we really pay attention if it's done in a randomized controlled trials will, I think with every trial, with every study design, whether it's observational or randomized trial, planning, careful planning and considerations of the designs are very, very important. And I think the, the good planning is the, from my point of view, is the uh, solution for the successful enterprise. And it doesn't matter whether the study is positive, a trial positive or negative. The worst enemies of the study or the trial is inconclusive because of the some problems on the design or the conduct stage. And so from that point of view, I think for me as a methodologist, uh, I'm always uh, faced with those questions. What is the best design? Should we do the clinical trial? Should we do random, uh, should we do observational studies? And I think the answer is always, it depends. It depends on a question. For some of the clinical questions, randomized design is just not feasible. For example, if we're trying to look at the 
prevention of a melanoma, which is, you know, devastating, but relatively rare condition. So if we're trying to uh, look at the question whether frequent screening for melanoma is efficacious in reducing the incidence, then I think if we think about the randomized controlled trial, such trial is going to take decades to, to design and it's likely unfeasible. But uh, we probably can use the data from large health systems to try to address this question and again, but if we would like to do it right, we need to use the modern and comprehensive epidemiologic methods. So I think it's always depends and there's a place for both designs. And I think it's really needs to be discussed with the team and decided uh, based on the pluses and minuses. Thanks, uh, thanks for those comments. We have a, a number of questions that have come through the uh, Q&A and I will get to those. So just uh, thank you for doing so and, and I'll invite people to continue doing so. But before we go to some of the uh, questions that are raised by the audience, perhaps uh, Nadia, I can let you uh, share some of your thoughts. Thank you, Lise, and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief to leave as much time for the, the Q&A as possible. I, you know, I think we're all sort of saying things similarly, but differently. And I think at the end of the day, you know, there, there's an issue of whether randomized controlled trials are either feasible or desirable. So think of anything related to studying the effect of the pandemic, whether it be uh, vaccine mandates or masks or, or the lockdown measures. How do we evaluate the impact or the effect of these measures? There's no way in which we can do randomization in the, in the context of of population level policy in such measures. So we know that there are contexts where you know, observational studies are, are, are definitely the way to go, but what about when uh, randomized control trials may not be desirable? So when we really wanna look at the impact in a real life context, so in an epidemiologic way, when we wanna look at the effect of lifestyle or look at the, the impact of, of belonging to an interprofessional primary care team, which is something I'm looking at right now versus not where, where naturally, these are natural experiments and we wanna be able to evaluate these natural experiments. These are cases where we wouldn't want to have to force randomization. And um, I think at the end of the day, you know, as, as some, many of my colleagues have said, both randomized trials and observational studies will fall on a spectrum of good to bad to ugly. So I think that you know, we cannot dichotomize them and put them on this one will always be better than that one because there are always ways to perform both types of these studies in very good ways or very poor ways but perhaps one of the advantages of randomized control trials is that they are intuitively more simpler to conduct and more intuitive in how they, how they, how they can be conducted. Uh, whereas to conduct a good observational study uh, will require more uh, methodologically robust methods. Uh, so in that sense, uh, randomized control trials offer that benefit. But I think as, as Ellie was saying, randomized control trials are also subject to a number of biases like loss to follow up, non-compliance, lack of blinding, missing data. And so I think it's just important to be aware uh, that they can go wrong in, in some ways and still have bias associated with them and not to, um, not, not to provide a false sense of security that if we randomize a study that we don't have to worry at all about bias. So I think that's an important consideration and maybe an advantage of conducting observational studies is that we go in knowing that there's bias. And so there's this, there's this additional cognizance of bias in conducting observational studies, which make us more explicit in considering how to minimize these at the design, at the analysis, and at the interpretation stage. So in that sense, you know, we may end up in the end if we can make all these considerations with, with very robust results, that if we, we had a more um, false sense of security with randomized trials, we might not have considered all these potential biases. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we, we've heard from the, uh, the panelists. And so now um, I'd like to share uh, some of the comments that have, uh, have come out in the discussion. But um, one of the things that I think is really uh, interesting is that um, you've all brought uh, forward the idea of the trade-off between internal validity and um, uh, external validity. But here are some of the comments and questions that we hear from uh, the people who are uh, in the audience. So um, 
uh, a first comment regarding, um, basically, it's the question that should really define the methodology. Might you provide some input as to what category of questions might be more suited for a randomized trial and uh, what might be more suited for observational trial? And I think, I think that you have started to address some of those uh, questions in your uh, opening comments. But um, also, one pretty uh, important point that is raised here is that um, um, there's agreement that uh, RCTs aren't immune to multiple post-randomization biases, but the question is, aren't observational studies also prone to these baseline confounding? And how do we actually measure what's, how, how, how can we go about um, choosing uh, carefully? Um, also, there was a question about what kind of things can go wrong? Can you elaborate a little bit more? What kind of things can go wrong in RCTs and what kind of things can go wrong in um, observational uh, trials? And in, in fact, um, there's a question, is, is there a disconnect also in terms of the time that's required to do one type of study versus the other type of study? And, you know, we've all heard the, 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 um, the, the problem that it takes, you know, many, many years before uh, the science actually gets implemented into practice settings. So um, I see that um, Elena has opened her uh, microphone. So maybe, uh, Elena, I can let you uh, say a few words on those, those issues. And uh, please, uh, for the audience, please do uh, continue to, um, uh, to share uh, different, uh, different ideas and questions that you have. Elena. Thank you, Liz. You've kind of you listed a whole gamut of questions that probably will take a book to write in order to address them. I will just touch upon a few. Which questions would be more suitable for trials versus observational studies? I think it's important the, the considerations that useful to take in duration and cost, because clinical trials are expensive enterprises. And sometimes if there are a large amount of data that are already available, such as in electronic medical records or some other sources that I think the balance between what it would cost and how much time it take would it take to do the trial versus analyze appropriately the data that's already available, I think very important. And I think what we need to realize that usually questions that are raised to the question of clinical trials are the questions that are very clinically relevant. For them, physicians need answers now in order to treat patients. And so the luxury of waiting for a decade until the trial is designed and conducted and analyzed may or may not be really an option. So that is important to, to recognize. That said, I think the trials are more prescriptive. So I think in order to design a proper trial, you probably can't take the classic book on clinical trials or brush the, the lecture notes. And I think you can follow the checklist and you can design a trial in a relatively straightforward setting. I think for the proper analysis of observational studies, you need much more analytic energy in order to do it right. So I think that's that's the balances. And I think the trials in some ways had been designed for pharmacologic interventions when it's more straightforward to design placebos. And I think those methods had been adopted to other settings, but that's where the, the more uh, questions should be addressed and thought through in, you know, when we're thinking about trials. Great, thank you. I see that uh, we have some rejoinders from both uh, Francois and from Ellie. Uh, so uh, Francois and then Alan also. So Francois, up to you. Thanks. Uh, well, so, uh, you know, you, you wanted a, a debate and a, a disagreement. So I, I'm going to maybe just express respectfully where I, I my opinion diverges here. Uh, I, I think we're highlighting common flaws of trials that are not inherent methodological problems, uh, except for the issue of whatever happens after randomization, which is uh, of concern, but you don't necessarily have to lose patients to follow up. You don't necessarily have to have missing data. You shouldn't actually. Uh, other problems that haven't been raised is that trials are typically too small to be informative. Randomization only balances the prognostic factors known and unknown in both groups if you have enough patients and typically they're too small. So, but these are not inherent. These are just flaws in specific projects, but they're, they're correctable, they're fixable without even speaking of the innovations that we'll discuss later that can further improve the, the, 
like the, the method. So I think we really have to distinguish these things. I, where I disagree with a comment that's been made is that whether observational studies do in fact constitute an alternative. So A, I think the, the limitations of trials are, are fixable. And then I don't know that observational data is a real is is a, is a, is, a, is really an alternative because you're right it could be it could it, it's real life data right it's it, it's it's but but if if you haven't fixed the <laughs> the residual confounding you will still potentially be attributing an effect to something that's not you know uh, uh, causing that effect so in a way what I'm saying is I guess the internal validity trumps the external validity and. And you know, it's not a. Like I've seen the comments. It's not a zero-sum game. Both have to be maximized. But the 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 the, the most uh, applicable data, real-world data. If you get it wrong, you you still get it wrong. And there, I've got it. Like i I've got lots of friends who tell me that what I consider the primacy of trials may not last forever. Maybe new technologies will fix this. Maybe deep learning and AI and all that will fix it. I just haven't seen it yet, and I'm quite concerned that. There's not enough data for observational uh, for for causal inferences to be completely trustworthy. If there's a lot of data and yet you can access it, the quality of it is still worrisome. I think a lot of data needs to be curated, and uh, if it's not, I don't know that you can interpret it. And then if you have the quality and the quantity, in many cases, I worry about confirmation bias. So if all of the doctors believe treatment A is good and systematically give treatment A without ever not giving it the best, best algorithm will not have the variation in, in the data that it needs to observe that that same treatment will actually be, be harmful. And so there are, I think we have to be careful in, you know, we can be critical of trials and improve, but I don't know that there is much of an alternative yet. I guess that would be, yeah, something I would have added. Excellent, Francois. Thank you for uh, some of those, uh, some of those thoughts, which, uh, uh, clearly will uh, elicit some comments because they are uh, at least somewhat uh, uh, provocateur. Uh, and um, perhaps also um, there's another question that has popped up and maybe the speakers who are going to go next would like to address it, is that, you know, since there will inevitably be observational data and RCT data, how do you go about combining them to, to get a bigger, bigger picture of uh, the evidence? But uh, for right now, uh, Ellie, why don't I let you uh, take it? And then we have uh, Alan and Nadia who'd like to say something as well. Ellie. Thanks. So um, yeah, I think that this is kind of a great example of where um, we can kind of get into this, this problem of thinking of them at randomized trials and observational studies as two completely separate sets of methodology when really we should be thinking about our goal, which is to estimate a causal effect or to determine whether some cause has an effect. Um, and then kind of looking at the, the set of possible things we can do there as sort of one set, complete set of choices where we choose some and some make us more like a randomized trial and some make us less like a randomized trial. Um, and I think um, Francois highlighted an important point that a lot of times in observational data, one of the big limitations is that we don't have that variation in exposure. And so in causal inference, we call this positivity or overlap. But the idea is if, if people can't have multiple different exposures for the question we want to ask, then we can't ask it in observational studies. So one thing we might ask ourselves is, are people actually being given the exposures that we want to compare, or the treatments that we want to compare? If so, maybe observational study is possible. If not, we have to do some kind of intervention study. But again, you know, thinking about you know, the ideal randomized control trial, that's also not the only kind of intervention study we can do. We can do a pragmatic trial. We can do a non-randomized intervention trial. We can do cluster randomized trials. There are a lot of different types of trials we can do. Um, and so you know, really, my, my, my feeling is it's just better to kind of think of it all as one piece and think about what gives us the best answer to the question that we want to ask in this particular case. And I think another um, kind of limitation of, of thinking of randomized control trials or trials and observational studies as so distinct and separate is that um, on the one hand, I think a lot of randomized trial people are sort of, you know, there are these great checklists and you can just kind of follow the textbook, but then people don't think about 
are there special circumstances in my trial? And they don't think about those sort of really deep, you know, what happens if I have a competing event? What happens if I do have more loss to follow up? We see a lot of complete case analyses that, it, you know, assumes dropout is completely random, um, which is not necessarily reasonable. And so I think that that can lead to this sort of overlooking of potential biases in the trial and also, you know, not considering non-adherence. And so you're getting this answer that's about assignment and not necessarily treatment. On the other hand, for observational studies, what I think we see is that, you know, and here again, you know, just like with trials, there's sort of the ideal observational study and the actual observational study conducted in the world. And so if we're going to think about perfect trials, we should think about perfect observational studies as a fair comparison, which I admit many, many, many are not. Um, but what we see in observational studies is that people think a lot about the specific circumstance, but we don't have a good set of checklists for how to structure your observational study. And what we often find is that a lot of the energy, like preparatory energy goes into who should be in the sample, who do we recruit? And it doesn't necessarily go as deeply into thinking through um, you know, all of the different, like exactly what do we mean by exposure? And, and you know, we see that in the nutritional studies that Elena brought up. Like if we ask some people today, you know, how often did you eat red meat in the last month? That is not at all the same thing as an intervention study where they're given a certain amount of red meat to eat over a certain amount of time. Um, and so, you know, the research questions are different. And I think observational studies, we kind of forget that part of, you know, when you design a trial protocol, it's not just about what is, you know, assigning the intervention. It, there's there's a lot that goes into the trial protocol that we often don't specify in observational studies too. Um, and so to my mind, you know, it's really sort of what question we want to ask. Do we need to intervene to compare those exposures? How do we feel about our understanding of confounding if we don't need to intervene? Um, do we feel like we can control that in an observational setting or do we still need the, the randomization um, in order to remove this unmeasured confounding that we can't capture. Um, and then in the trial setting, also thinking about all of the things that happen because most of your trial data is after randomization. And so it's not, it's, it's, it's really important when biases creep in there. Thanks. Uh, those are those are great, uh, great ideas and great points. And you've uh, you're we're going to give an opportunity to uh, Alan and, and Nadia to to share some ideas. But then we'll go to some of the questions about what are the alternatives and what are the innovations that um, exist in in this uh, regard. So um, uh, Alan and uh, Nadia, and uh, thank you to the audience who, who continue to provide really relevant questions, which I'll address in just a bit. Yeah, thanks. So I'd like to address the question a little bit of what are the factors that make one more appropriate than the other? At the same time, responding to, to Francois's comment on internal validity, trumping external validity, and the questions of integrating it that we have from the audience as well. So the way that I look at this is that sometimes internal validity does trump external validity. If you have a major bias in confounding, all the rest doesn't matter, right? And, and I think this is the, the thing that you know, this is behind a lot of the causal inference methods in observational studies, behind randomized controlled trials. And I think in some cases, it's just essential. But I think there are other cases, and I think this is like, I guess my main critique of how we think about things, is we just apply that as if it's a blanket prescription for all cases. And so I think, you know, a very relevant example that we're all seeing is, is, is COVID-19 vaccines. And we do have good randomized controlled trials that show that they were, were safe and, and, and effective at the beginning, and now we're using them, right? But now we have incredible sample sizes from observational studies of everybody that's vaccinated. And we're all relying on what percentage of hospitalizations are vaccinated versus non-vaccinated. And there are biases that could be there. We can't pretend it's a perfectly you know, randomized design. It's clearly not random who chooses to be vaccinated or not. But I don't think anybody's out there seriously questioning that the differences we see in hospitalization rates are due to the vaccine, right? And I, I, I think that's because we understand that at some level, confounding is not that much of an issue in this context, right? So the observational study in this particular case has huge advantages of being enormous and giving us a lot more information about like, you know, who benefits more from you know, maybe this vaccine versus that vaccine, who is susceptible to this side effect or that side effect. And we shouldn't be discounting that information because it's observational. We should be understanding that in this particular context, the, the confounding is not that much of an issue 
And the benefits of generalizability and sample size and accessibility and rapidity far outweigh what would be required to get to a randomized controlled trial design there. Um, and so the point that I want to tie this together with is I think we need to put in, be putting it all together. So the current way we think is randomized controlled trials are the gold standard. If it's not a randomized controlled trial, it's not going to get much weight in how we construct our clinical guidelines. But really what we should be saying is if the randomized controlled trial doesn't agree with the observational studies and our mechanistic understanding and all the rest of it, we want to understand why, right? We want to be able to put that all together with you know, some critical thinking about can we understand why there's a discrepancy? And if we can't, then we might want to question how good our evidence is. And maybe we can explain it very easily by confounding, and there we're, then we're confident that the randomized controlled trials are giving us the right answer, right? Or maybe we want to kind of, you know, we see that it all agrees, and now we have a much higher level of confidence than if we only had randomized controlled trials because it agrees with observational and mechanistic inferences about the whole system. Um, so I, I think we need to integrate it all. Um, thank, thank you. There's a, a steady stream of uh, questions and comments uh, coming in, but maybe I can uh, just add one other comment and maybe Nadia, you'll want to say something about this. Is there a difference also between pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic trials that we have to uh, address as well? And I think, you know, explicitly. So uh, Nadia, your, uh, your turn. You had your hand raised, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I, I can definitely talk to that, but I also feel like I want to answer in terms of, I know the second question coming up of how, you know, what are some of the innovations and methods and how can they answer some of these questions that we're having? So I might also talk on both of those things, but definitely, you know, thinking about uh, randomized trials and observational studies, the context in which you can apply them will be different, whether they're pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic. And as Alan said, and, you know, thinking about the pandemic, we're in a situation where you know, considering randomization is simply not possible or feasible. But in the pharmacologic setting, if we want to know in a very controlled environment what the impact of a new drug might be, then yes, randomized trials are the way to go. But we know often that this drug may be used off-label, may be used in populations for which the drug is not approved. And so that's where observational studies come in to look at how things actually work in real life. And so the, the thing is not to necessarily any, any single study is flawed, but it's the, pop, the body of evidence together that we hope point in the right direction, in the same direction. And to, to get to the issue of confounding, which really is you know, the, the nature of the beast in, in, in all of our studies, is I think there's an under-awareness of how much observational methods for observational studies have advanced in the last 20, 30 years. And there has been some literature shown that with you know, advanced causal inference methods like instrumental variables and other, other methods that we can explain in more detail, that you can get similar results as randomized trials. So if we think about you know, trying to equate, trying to balance the field, there may be opportunity now to get the, the best out of both worlds from internal validity and an external validity point of view by applying these stronger and newer methods. And there was this study looking at the effect of COX-2 inhibitors that had done a, an observational study, but they had an, an, a, a very large degree of confounding. And so what they had decided to do was to apply an instrumental variable, which was a physician's preference for prescribing that medication over another medication. And this, this method gets around the problem of confounding, if you will. And they were able to show that the, that the impact that they observed was very consistent with other randomized trials. So there is this possibility now, and I think there just needs to be, you know, better knowledge translation and cross-pollination of, of our fields to see that there are opportunities where we could gain the best of both worlds, where we could mimic a randomized setting without all the um, aspects that come with a randomized setting, such as the increased time and cost. So the, the challenge with that is the increase in complexity in applying those methods. And that's where you know, a multidisciplinary setting is needed because we need to work as a team and it takes a village to be able to conduct a study in the best way possible. And how do we support how do we keep disseminating these methods in a way that they start to become known? And I think even within the medical education field, you know, I teach to medical students and, and the only thing they're taught is about randomized trials. And so they don't even know that there's possibilities beyond that to think about. And we know, for example, how important 
qualitative methods can be in studying how I know patients patients needs and and other things. So it's it's a mixture of methods and it's and it's a multidisciplinary multi method approach. I think that we need to favor versus a pyramid approach where this is better than that. Thank you, Nadia. I see that um, um, uh, Elena has uh, some comments, but maybe I'll take this opportunity to uh, transition to the second overarching question that was raised by uh, these panelists in preparing for this event. And in fact, um, maybe um, uh, uh, Elena, you can uh, comment, provide your comment and then uh, stream into to answering this question also, and then I'll go to the other speakers as well. Um, what are some of the recent innovations that you're excited about, both for RCTs and for observational studies, which look most promising and what are the challenges of uh, implementing them? And I'd like to mention that uh, in the uh, Q&A, there have been some questions about um, these issues, like what do we do if we understand that there are limitations with different kinds of approaches and how do we go about designing studies in the era of big data because there are different sources of information with different uh, data sources with different quality. And there's even a question uh, in the uh, Q&A about um, is, is there an issue also around the politics of science that might um, uh, direct different uh, uh, questions and exchanges. So um, Elena, uh, maybe I'll let you make the comment that you had in mind and then you can stream into this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Liz. I think it's important to kind of to keep our discussion balanced. And I think, you know, we all, I think sharing um, some of our experiences and knowledge and um, concerns, I think I just full disclosure, I think if both designs observational and clinical randomized trials sort of available to me in terms of feasibility, cost, and time, I think I would opt for randomized trial. And, you know, one of the reasons for that, because this is the design that I'm much more comfortable with, and this is the design that I uh, studied a lot and did a lot. And I think the level of experience, it's important to recognize it's the same, you know, when there is a surgeon who has been trained to do one approach in, in surgery and had gotten very good when, with that, uh, then the question is whether he, she will be equally ready to move to another approach could be equally good or have some, uh, has some advantages. And I think the person may receive better results with the approach that you know, he is the most trained for. So I think the experience is important to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of, I think, uh, every science is evolving and um, epidemiology and clinical sciences evolve all the time. And again, so the, the, the modern causal inference methods helped us to overcome a lot of uh, concerns about the analysis of observational studies, but that should equally be said about randomized controlled trials. I think there is a lot of newish designs. So the question was always, what if we guessed wrong? And then we have the sequential trials, then we have cluster randomized trial, then we have end to one trial. So there is a lot of new design. Then, you know, we distinguish between superiority, non-inferiority trials. Every in each of them has its own advantages and also drawbacks because there is no free lunch. And I think it's all based on the story that I agree with Ellie completely. It's important to understand what is the question and what is the resources that we have that could help to get to the answer, hopefully unbiased answer to this question in the shortest possible time, because time is always an essence in clinical decision-making. And I just would like to talk a little bit again, evolving methods in machine learning. I think we need to recognize they all, every time new methods come to 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 uh, to mind that you know they all seem very exciting and sexy and everybody is jumping into the new methods but we also need to recognize that not always new methods are applicable to all questions and we need to recognize what machine learning methods are good for and when they just they kind of the the marketing and language things but basically indicate um, the same old analytic methods with just the new name. And the excitement in, um, I think, epidemiologic knowledge that I um, learn and trying to use as much as I can, especially if the, the, the trial design is not feasible from, especially from ethical consideration, that's a target trial. And I think it's really helps to think 
in the language of designing trial, but apply the same principles in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria outcomes in trying to think in the trial term, but applying it to observational studies. And I find this bridging a very, very helpful. Yes, thank you, uh, Elena. Um, perhaps I'll uh, call on uh, Francois uh, at this point to, to comment on some innovations, but I'd like to also mention a, a comment that was um, in the uh, Q&A, which is um, a critical issue for RCTs is the, is the issue of clinical equipoise. And if you do a trial too early or too late, it won't really be informative. And I think, Francois, you were addressing at least some of those um, issues in your uh, comment on the chat. So. Uh, Francois, about innovations, where do we go from here? So, like, obviously, the take-home message when we close, I was, I'm also going to say that the op optimal scenario is where you harness the strengths of all those designs, right? I, we'll all agree on this. I think we might uh, have different uh, interpretations of whether it's better to harness the advantages of observational sciences within the clinical trial approach or vice versa. I, I, I think. Uh, to me, the, the 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 most exciting innovations in the RCT world are not the quote unquote exciting ones. It's it, like they're, they're, it's it's about. I, I don't think people mention that trials are costly and they take ten years. That's wrong, right? But we we it took three months to enroll ten thousand patients in the UK and figure out whether steroids work for COVID. So it, it, it's the way we've been going about things. There's a question about the politics of trials. I completely agree. Like health shouldn't be hospital centric, shouldn't be MD centric. The fact that it's been done in a certain way that there's a culture around RCTs doesn't, it's not inherently, it's not inherent to RCTs themselves. So the most exciting innovation is that it has to do with something that's simple, but that's hard. It's that collective discussion. It's choosing to make uh, research an integral component of health, uh, deciding to harness the health system to learn about health. Uh, it's what our probably our UK colleagues have done the best in this on this planet, and it's to to to, to invest in this collective infrastructure and um, and make sure that there's always an opportunity to learn. It's to educate the public. There's no reason a trial like people are making distinctions between a pragmatic trial. These are all trials. Um, they can be pragmatic. So the, the advantages that people speak about when they talk about observational studies, these can be characteristics of trials as well. You, there's no reason you can't enroll everyone, like the entire population. The limitations are, it doesn't have to be costly. I mean, they're ethical, they're legal, there's the, the cost issue, but the, the, the cost can be reduced. And, um, and you have to also consider not only the cost of doing a trial, but the cost of not doing the trial, like the cost for the system of choosing to buy crazy expensive drugs or vaccines. Uh, I mean, to Alan's point, the reason you've got such great observational studies is that there was some confidence that this would be effective and not too harmful. If we had started buying and administering vaccines on this scale without some proof of efficacy, you could have ended up paying a lot more. So the most exciting innovation is just this collective discussion that we want to do this and it needn't be complex or expensive or protracted, that can work. Then the platforms, that's a special design that has added value, I think. It, it makes it somewhat more efficient. It's not a game changer. It makes it more efficient because it's an ongoing pipeline. You feed in questions, you, questions come out and the comparator sort of evolves over time and the results sort of remain current. Like they, there's a lesser risk of becoming outdated, but it's not a game changer. You can, you can do very efficient things without exciting designs. And then the other very like even more quote unquote exciting stuff is all the advanced analytics that we talk about when we talk about very like causal inferences, that's also amenable to the, the uh, experimental sort of design. You can do this within an RCT and perhaps have to, you know, re reduce the number of patients that you need to recruit to draw conclusions or to study heterogeneity of treatment effects. So these are exciting innovations, but the most exciting thing is that we can do a lot of stuff with to a two by two table and, you know, pencils and papers, I think. But, but there's a collective decision to be made about doing that. Yes, uh, soon uh, papers and pen pencils may be considered an innovation, uh, uh, in fact, if we continue to, to go digital. So, Nadia, maybe I can turn it over to you and then to Ellie. Uh, what are some of the innovations that you're excited about? 
Well, for, first, first, I, I think it's important, you know, in the era of big data, and I think as Elena said, to, to know that big data does not equal good data, you know, and so I think in, in any context, it's important to when you're designing a study to really be explicit at the beginning and take the time to think about the question and also the, the, the conceptualization of the study. So what are the data that you need to be able to properly address all the bias and confounding that could happen? And what are the data you don't have? And I think in terms of the data you don't have, you know, that's a really important piece that I think the causal inference methods have been really good at forcing us to be really explicit about, you know, defining the intervention, defining the, the, the design, defining the, the, the confounders you know, through these causal diagrams. And one innovation that I found really exciting and, and useful is, is called the E-value, which is a very intuitive, simple metric that was um, uh, came, came up by Tyler Vanderweel, which is an epidemiologist at Harvard. And it's simply a measure that allows you to say, how big would my unmeasured confounder have to be to flip my results? And it's, it's such an intuitively simple but useful metric to say how robust are these observational results. And I think in terms of guidelines, in terms of moving forward, this should really be something we attach to all the research we do. So something, you know, it's not enough. And I think sensitivity analysis is in the place that we put that in our articles. That's a whole other discussion of, you know, the space we have to really talk about the robustness of our results. But this e-value is really nice to say, look, uh, it would have to take a confounder at an odds ratio of five to flip the result that I've seen. So now as a reader and as a clinician trying to read that evidence, you say, okay, I'm pretty confident that, that these observational results are going to remain valid in most contexts. But if a very tiny confounder can be enough to nullify your effect, then that's room for uh, you need to dig in deeper and look for more research. So out of the innovations, I would say that's really one um, that I like and that's been really useful in my own research. Uh, and, and lastly, I would just say that, you know, again, th th there's this idea that I think the way we do research is very, there's a lot of subcultures, you know, and I think causal inference really got really strong in pharmacopidemiology, as Ellie can speak to, and, and me being in primary care research, I saw how little it was being applied in that world. And so I've, I've had this effort to try to bring these methods over. But, but besides those methods, you know, hearing about, you know, innovations in other fields, I think there needs to be more space to translate methods across disciplines and to be able to have this appear in, in guidelines uh, for reporting and conducting studies that are not too discipline specific so that we can learn from what's happening in different areas. Excellent, uh, thank you. Maybe I can uh, turn it over now to uh, Ellie. What are some of the innovations that you're um, excited about? And uh, maybe I can also uh, uh, ask people to, to make a comment. Uh, there's something that came through the, the Q&A about um, making relevant anonymized patient level data available to the research uh, community. And um, for those of you who may have seen the headlines in today's issue of Nature, um, NIH has just issued a seismic mandate to share data publicly. And so uh, maybe we can also have some discussion comment on that. Ellie, over to you. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, certainly there have been big uh, developments in causal inference methods, and um, a lot of them are very sophisticated, but I think that the really the core of the innovation in causal inference that lets us think about doing not just our observational studies better, but also our trials better, as Francois says, is the idea of thinking about um, basically kind of boils down to the idea that bias doesn't come from nowhere. <laughs> bias is information that isn't the information we were trying to learn. And so thinking from the beginning about what is everything that we know so far, how are all of the different variables related in terms of confounders, in terms of um, causes of loss to follow up, in terms of competing events, in terms of selection variables, in terms of all of these things, what are all those variables? How are they all related? What do we already know? What do we not yet know and how do we isolate the part that we're trying to learn about. Um, I think that that really is kind of the best innovation and it applies this equally to observational studies and trials because you know there's not going to be equipoise to do a trial where we already have a very good idea of what the answer is, um, for example. Um, and I think 
you know, uh, Elena already mentioned this uh, this concept of the target trial framework, and that that's kind of what I like to think about is that regardless of what kind of study we're doing, if we're trying to estimate a causal effect or, or identify a causal effect, we want to first start thinking about what is this hypothetical perfect experiment we would do to answer the question we want to do. And we can lay that out really carefully and then think about how do we operationalize that in the real world? And maybe it's in a trial, in which case we're coming up with our trial protocol based on how close can we get it to that perfect ideal trial protocol. Um, or maybe it's an observational study, or maybe it's one of these things in between like a non-randomized intervention study or um, a quasi-experimental study with an IV or something. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that implementation, but we're always really just trying to get back to this same sort of hypothetical, perfect, you know, laboratory controlled experiment, which is not what we're actually doing in health research or public health research, because we're not like locking people up in facilities and con controlling everything about their experiences while, while we're, we're looking at the effect of an exposure on them. Um, and so I think that, that that kind of framework of thinking about, you know, what is everything we know? How do we isolate the piece we don't know? If we have observational studies and randomized trials, are we sure that they're asking the same question? Should they actually be giving us the same answer? Um, if they're asking different questions, then what does that, what extra information do we get from the fact that their answers are different? Um, if they're asking the same question and the answer is different, then one of them must have bias in it. Where is that bias coming from? What else does that tell us about things that might cause this exposure or things that might cause its outcome or things that might be mediators? And how can we learn as much as possible from the information we have? I think that that kind of framing our thinking that way is really the, the, the sort of biggest innovation to my mind in, in this space. Thank you. Um, Oh, please go ahead. Please oh, go I was ahead. just going to sort of touch briefly on the the issue of data availability because um, you know, as as someone who does methods research, I rely a lot on other people sharing their data, um, and you know, I know for quite some time the NIH has had um, you know this this requirement that trials are supposed to make a publicly available data set to be shared through the NIH website if they're funded by the NIH. Um, and you know we have we have seen that the portals are available for that, but that's not really been happening anyway. Um, and I think that that kind of partly I think is you know because there are reasons people don't necessarily want to share their data, but also partly because there are real challenges with sharing data and creating a data set that is um, sufficiently de-identified, sufficiently clean, sufficiently labeled, and sufficiently like ready for someone to use is not simple and every every you know data set that i have you know applied for and been able to access you know the data structure is completely different the way you know files are set up how many different files how how the, how things are are sort of thought about how variables are related it's also different there's really not any standardization there and i think that that adds further challenges to the idea of making data available and you know in this perfect world we would all be able to access all the data and do whatever we want with it but that's that's not realistic <laughs> Thank you for, for bringing that in, uh, into focus. Um, Alan, how about the innovations that you're excited about here? And then I uh, have two, two uh, interesting uh, hypotheses to put forward that have come through the Q&A. So Alan, please. Yeah, so uh, I'll follow up with what Ellie was saying. Uh, like I, I, I'm actually quite excited about the ability to be sharing more data, but I'm less focused on individual studies and more on clinical data. And I think there's huge issues here in the sense that like in some ways, Google already has access to a lot more information. You know, and we're not that worried about Google accessing all that information, but if I want to access as a researcher, some information that might be less, like the, the, the barriers are huge here in Quebec, I can maybe have to wait years to get that data and, and pay, pay a ton of money for it. And, but you know, we, we need to be very sensitive to privacy concerns. So like this is a whole, it's, it's a can of worms, but I do think that we're in the context of a world where privacy is kind of disappearing in some ways, and we're moving towards having more access to these data. And I think it's a good feed into the innovations that I'm interested in, because for me, the innovations actually are coming from access to clinical data, right? I mean, there's a lot of great innovations, but the ones that excite me the most are you know, here in Sherbrooke, we have, we're in the process of developing electronic medical record systems 
that are based on a shared ontology across all of the different healthcare providers in the region. So you get full data on everybody that lives here. And, you know, unless they're going elsewhere, which in this case, not that many people do. And what this means is that we could, you know, if, if this is real time data, we can now think about taking clinically questions that are in clinical equipoise and randomizing them clinically in our region, right? And we could just generate a thousand clinical trials by just programming them into the system and telling clinicians, this patient got randomized for this, this one got randomized for that. Now there's all kinds of ethical issues. Right? So what we, I think we're at the point where we need to move towards a new ethical framework for how we think about this because the data availability is, is changing everything, right? And, and so I think that there are, you know, rather than doing these huge, very expensive trials, we can do mini trials or sort of trials within the context of these clinical data. And so I think what's happening actually is that we're seeing a convergence of observational and experimental data. Like this is kind of a, a mix of the two in some sense. We're kind of maybe limited in terms of the outcome measurement to what's already in the, in the system, but then we, we can randomize people. Or as Francois was mentioning, we have platform trials, which are maybe a little less perfectly randomized in some cases. I don't, I don't know the details that well, but then, then a traditional trial, but that offer you the ability to look with more sophistication at different combinations of things. And so, you know, I, I think we're kind of moving towards a world where these things come together. And I think that's actually really fascinating. Um, so I'm excited about that. That's great. There, there, um, we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, ahead of us before uh, we ask you to make a statement regarding um, uh, some of the take home messages, but um, maybe I'll just sort of share some of the ideas and you can go uh, en vrac uh, regarding uh, how you would like to answer it. One of the uh, uh, questions uh, that's being addressed is, um, uh, can't we all agree that studying potential harmful outcomes necessitates observational designs, whereas studying beneficial effects are better studied by um, experimental designs? And uh, in continuity with the last point about the electronic medical records and ontologies, um, uh, the question about um, is SNOMED a tool to be encouraged for increased uh, data quality and sharing? And um, maybe um, you can also, uh, you're all people who are involved in teaching, but there's, um, what are some of the thoughts on innovations in terms of teaching and training the current and next generation of uh, researchers? So I see that uh, Ellie's hand has popped up. So Ellie, over to you. Um, so I think uh, a lot of what I'm spending my time on these days is um, thinking about how do we get these methods from, you know, this more epi statistical journals and into the hands of practitioners. Um, because, you know, as, as Nadia alluded to, they've been used in a few very specific subfields of research, but really not that widely in other fields. And so um, I think, you know, I and, and, and some, some other colleagues have really identified this as that there's this sort of translation gap in translating the methods from the sort of more theoretical to the applied pieces. And so I think that's where a lot of us are, are working on thinking about, okay, what are the challenges you might encounter if you want to you know, build a really good comprehensive causal graph? Like that's not something you can just sit down and sketch out in, you know? So I have you know, students who spend an entire year you know, talking to experts and reading papers and, and coming up with really detailed causal graphs that can then inform um, how we do, do our research or, um, you know, how do we then think about, okay, what question really should we be asking and what are the types of qualitative work that we need to inform, do to figure out what is the actual appropriate comparison we need to make, especially when we're thinking about something that's not as simple as a pharmacological drug that may have been tested at a certain um, you know, uh, a dosage. If we're thinking about nutrition, for example, what actually is the relevant question? Or if we're thinking about um, something uh, in primary care or something about birth experiences, what are, the what are the relevant questions? What are the questions that clinicians have, um, you know, aren't sure about and feel like they need decisions made on, but also what are the questions that um, individuals or, or patients feel are important to them and how do we frame those questions, the studies to answer those questions as well. Um, and so thinking about kind of all of those and how, how we develop some, some best practices and guidance around them, because, um, you know, as, as Alina also mentioned, you know, we've had, we've had many, many years of randomized trials and whereas these causal inference methods have really only um, kind of come into their full uh, usability in 
in this, you know, this millennium. And so, you know, now we really need to think about how do we actually apply them? What are the challenges we overcome? And, and then how, how do we get people to use them is kind of the next step. But we can't just hand people, you know, a set of equations and say, go implement this. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll uh, thank you for those those comments. I guess I'll turn over to Alan. I saw you uh, your head nodding your head when you heard the SNOMED. Maybe you can make some comments uh, on SNOMED, and then I'll go over to Elena. I actually don't feel like I, I have that much to add on SNOMED. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I'll, I'll let you go to Elena, and, and we won't take time for that. Thanks. Okay, excellent, Elena. Yeah, I just would like to comment on where we're going and how, what effort do we want to envision in order to get broader audience more comfortable with the, with the new methods. And I just would like to give kind of some example from statistics. So I think it's about 50 years ago, it was a new innovation in how to address correlated data because before it was always a very challenging question because most of these classical statistical methods were designed for independent observations. And once you have fingers of the same hands or teeth of the same person or knees of the same person, so you clearly have violated this assumption. And so, and then the um, correlated data methods had been developed. And the interesting jump was that in the beginning, the first few years, it was very rarely used, but then they began to be used everywhere appropriately and not appropriately. And it was kind of had been viewed as the recipe for successful publication. If you just comment that you will, that you had been using some of the proper variance adjustments. And I think it is important to recognize that every methodological advancement should be viewed within the clinical question that we are investigating. And that by teaching and disseminating, that's the way to make, you know, more methodologists comfortable teaching new generation of medical students to bring some of the methods in providing some very clear examples, and really helping to show what the benefits are, because most of our teaching saying, this is how you can analyze the data. But I think, um, kind of thinking about myself, what would be very, very useful is to say, so here is what it would take to do a randomized clinical trial. It would take you 10 years and we, you know, this is the results and give it a real example of the trial and then show, but these, these data were available at the same time that the trial was designed. And if you would analyze data using the causal inference methods, you know, stating, framing the same question, this is the results that you could have been getting a year from the beginning of the analysis or two years. And I think just seeing the benefits and realizing that one size never fits all. There are certain questions that, again, we would never be able to, to do randomized trials and observational studies are the only option and we just need to do it with the best scientific and methodological rigor we can. Um, but there are some situations for post-operative pain management that randomized clinical trial is the most feasible and the best approach because they can be done in a relatively short period of time and especially if the procedure is relatively common. So I think in that with that in mind, we just need to ensure that our, I would say, uh, more advanced but potentially less senior methodologists are being incorporated in our study sections, grant reviews, and editorial boards that they are helping to uh, review the scientific um, publications that using those novel methodologies and by that trying to disseminate and incorporate them more. And I think that's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. But as I said, you know, as nobody knew about GE methods 30 years ago, now everybody's using them. I am hopeful and an optimist that, you know, the day will come that many of people or methodologists in clinical research will be equally comfortable with both methods and see it as an advantageous um, kind of uh, to use different study designs to come to the same answer to the same clinical question, because if anything, it just robustness always helps to improve clinical care. Excellent, thank you, uh, Elena. 
It's uh, about uh, 21 minutes after the hour, so we're, our time has uh, uh, is flying away. And so I'll just share one of the questions uh, that you may or may not want to uh, uh, respond to when um, when we go to the take home messages. Um, and the question reads, um, uh, what are your thoughts on trial emulation initiatives such as RCT uh, duplicates? So you may want to decide to make some comments uh, on that. But at this point in time, we've had some very, very good discussion. There's been uh, a lot of exchange on the Q and A. Um, right now, I'd like to give people um, an opportunity to uh, say, what are the take home messages that you would like people to uh, leave with uh, from this, uh, this panel, panel discussion? And so, um, Elena, perhaps I can start, uh, start with you. Sure, I hope that the take home message is for everybody here is that it always depends on the clinical question and getting the question right helps to get the answer right. That's that's terrific, and uh, indeed, that is an important theme. It's uh, it's not only about the question; it's about getting it getting it uh, right. Uh, excellent. So, uh, Francois, maybe I can uh, ask you what what are some of the take home messages you've expressed? Some very strong and very interesting and useful points of view. What are your your take home messages for people? I hope I didn't express those ideas too strongly. I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite open-minded and like I said, things are evolving and I, I'm, I'm happy to revise my position. But um, two take-home messages, I, I think I, I sort of been hearing or we might have been conveying that currently guidelines and the KT activities don't factor in observational data as it is. I think that's wrong. I think they should and the good ones actually do. So things like adverse effects are notoriously underreported, undermeasured in trials, and we rely on guideline panels right now on observational data to monitor this. So, so, and more and more, it will increasingly, we will increasingly be using observational data and or methods. So guideline panels rely on network meta-analyses. So these are trials, but we're comparing the efficacy of different interventions in different studies. So it's sort of a, a mix, right? And uh, so it's already happening and it certainly will happen more and more. I, like I, I trust in that. If, like I said, my take home message is harnessing the strength of both. But to me, that means incorporating the strengths of the observational approach to the RCT sort of approach rather than replacing the experimental approach by, by advanced methodologies. And like what Alan presented, whether it's the pragmatic, whether it's the platform trial, whether it's systematically having a parallel cohort to challenge the, the effect estimates in the trial, whether it's embedding your trial in real life data so that you don't collect something artificial separately, but actually have the real world data and continue to longitudinally follow up your RCT for all of those to me are still trials, right? But they're benefiting from the add-ons and the, the great strengths of observational approaches. And the other thing, like I think whether pharmacological or non-pharmacological, whether it's a cluster trial, whether it's an end of one trial, they're still randomizing something. It's still an experiment. So these are variations on the theme of trials, which I think remain important, though you can draw on the strengths of, of alternate uh, approaches for sure. Thanks, that's great. It uh, almost sounds like a, a summary statement about the, the need for both types of approaches. Thank you, Francois, for, for those comments and also for mentioning uh, that we really do need to get the evidence into clinical practice uh, guidelines. Um, Ellie, why don't I turn over to you? What are your take home messages? Yeah, so I think uh, my take home message uh, is, you know, pretty much what I have, have been saying that, you know, we need to kind of stop thinking so much of RCTs and observational studies as completely separate frameworks and, um, you know, stop thinking about trial data and observational data specifically as, as completely separate frameworks and start thinking about it under this one kind of common umbrella. And that's not to say that we should, um, you know, be less skeptical of observational studies or anything. And in, in fact, it's more of that to say that we should be probably in a lot of cases more skeptical of both observational studies and trial studies. And that across the board, there are problems that are showing up in the research that need to be addressed. And we need to think more systematically about how we're asking our questions, how we're designing our studies to make sure that these problems don't creep in. And so, you know, I agree with Francois, it's great to have a 
randomized trial where you can continue to follow people up for five, 10, 15, 20 years. But we have to remember that every minute we get further from the point of randomization, the more potential biases that accrue. And so the more things we need to think about in terms of um, reducing that bias as we try to estimate an effect there. Um, and so um, just kind of going back to the, 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 the last um, listener question, that, that to my mind, that is the, the trial emulation idea, that that is the same thing as the target trial framework. And so you can um, try to emulate the target trial with a well-designed observational study, and you can try to emulate the target trial with a well-designed randomized trial. And the choice of whether to do so is going to depend on, you know, are you looking at a beneficial or harmful exposure? What kinds of you know, exposures are you interested in? What kind of populations do you have access to? Those kinds of things. But those are downstream of, of this sort of idea of what would you really ideally like to be doing? That's terrific. Thanks, and uh, thanks for providing some uh, some input into that uh, that question that was uh, that was raised. Uh, Nadia, how about you? What are some of the take home messages that you'd like people to leave with? Yeah, I think that you know, I think we need to recognize that a lot of these new methods that have come out in the last twenty years really represent a paradigm shift in how we should be planning, analyzing, and interpreting studies. And uh, there needs to be a lot more in terms of knowledge translation for one across different fields, but also supporting clinicians and other researchers from the point of design all the way to the point of peer review. So how do we how do we put this infrastructure in place? How do we support the research community in being able to access these new methods, considering that not all of us can become experts on everything? So I think that's an important consideration. And, and thinking about how innovations actually take place, well, it usually comes from a source of champions and early adopters who will take on these methods and will be champions in you know, disseminating these methods. And I think this is what we're trying to start to do. And it takes both support and through champion work to get these methods across uh, and to get to a place where we can start to think of them as GEEs, as Elena said. So thank you everyone uh, for this great discussion. Uh, thanks. So, uh, the th and thank you for speaking to the uh, issue of uh, training the current and next uh, generation and uh, bringing innovations into the to the mainstream. So maybe I can uh, turn it over now to uh, to Alan uh, for the um, for, perhaps for uh, first of all for the take home messages that you might like and uh, maybe a wrap up and then I'll say a final word afterwards. Sure, thank you. So I'll, I'll start with kind of my take home messages, then I'll clearly distinguish, come, wrap up for, for, for everybody. So I think my take home message would be basically that we need to start teaching, I think particularly in medical school, start teaching the importance of different types of proof and integrating that rather than having kind of a recipe or a formula that just says randomized control trials are great. Um, I think if everybody thought about it with the same sophistication that Francois does, I'd have much less problem. But I think we, we the, the kind of in the medical community, there's this stereotype or bias against anything that's not a randomized controlled trial. It's kind of blind to a lot of other factors. And I think that's a problem. So I think, you know, the root problem here is, you know, is to start changing the culture of that in, in medical education, in journals, in, in granting agencies, you know, all, all over. Um, and, you know, it's not to say, I completely agree, agree with Francois that, Experimental evidence is a crucial part of all this, right? But it's case by case how crucial and how we need to integrate that. Um, and in particular, I guess uh, I'll add one little um, nuance to what I said earlier, that I think one of the ways we can distinguish that is when you're in a highly complex system where the answer, you know that everything is interacting with everything else and the answer is likely to depend on a bunch of factors, now experimental evidence is weaker because it's likely very context dependent. When you get to a simpler system, and there are also, even though our bodies and sociology is complex, there are simpler questions. And when you're at one of those questions, I think randomized controlled trials are often both very generalizable and very strong evidence um, and, and good ways of, of getting around confounding. So I think that, that's, that's part of it as well. Um, I'll also mention just very briefly in terms of the emulation question, I interpreted that a little differently than Ellie did. So I think both answers are interesting depending on how we want to interpret it. But I, I think the question is, should we try to emulate, that is replicate uh, randomized controlled trials? And I guess my answer to that would be no, in the sense that if you're trying to replicate it, you're trying to do exactly the same thing. We already have one that did that. So if you have that much time and budget and everything, do something slightly different. And now we're starting to attack the question from a different angle and you're getting more robustness if you, if you confirm and if you're not getting the same answer, now you have to wonder why did it work here and not there. So I, I 
prefer to not perfectly replicate as a general principle, but to go towards different types of things and see if they converge. Um, so that's my personal wrap up. I'll now try to wrap up for everybody. Um, I'm going to try to launch a poll here uh, at the same time that I'm talking. I'm not very good at doing that, but I think it's launched. So this is kind of for everybody to, to see where you're at at the end of the debate. Um, I think there's a lot of agreement among all of us uh, in that there are situations where all types of um, study designs are relevant. There's no one thing that's always going to be the best. Um, but there's also a fair amount of disagreement in the sense that I think uh, Francois and Elena are certainly more on the side of randomized controlled trials, if you can do them, are, you know, experimental approaches are really crucial and there's nothing that can really fully replace that if you can do it well. And uh, I think, you know, Ellie is arguing for this kind of continuum between observational and, and randomized controlled trials and that there's, we need to start looking at them less as two distinct categories. I think Nadia and I are, are, are more on the side of there are other methods and ways of getting at things that are often going to be um, uh, interesting alternatives to randomized controlled trials. Um, although I think we probably all recognize that there are cases when randomized controlled trials will be preferred and cases where observational studies will be preferred. I think all, all five of us would agree on that. Um, so it's been a lot of fun for me. Um, I'd like to also end uh, thanking the three research centers that supported this, the CR Schum in Montreal, the CR Schuss here in Sherbrooke, and the Centre de Recherche sur le the Aging Research Center here in Sherbrooke. Um, I'll also mention that we are going to be uh, emailing all the participants who signed up uh, with a, a Google form survey, which we will integrate the results of into the, into the article that we hope to generate as, as a result of this discussion. Um, so please uh, participate in that when the email comes um, and it will be anonymous. So, uh, you know, um, that will get your opinions on a lot of these different questions. Um, and with that, I will say thank you once more and turn it over to, to Lise again. Well, thank you. I have only one more task to, to perform uh, today. And that's to uh, say it's a pleasant one. It's to say a big, big thank you very much for to each one of the, the panelists for having shared some of their thoughts. Um, we had a really lovely turnout for this event. So uh, merci beaucoup, bon après-midi, and especially à bientôt. See you soon. <laughs>